Hello and welcome back to the Quantum Reading Seminar. In the last video, we looked at the classical analog of the construction proposed by Hayden and Preskill in their paper, Black Holes as Mirrors. And here, the crucial concept of a classical randomizer was introduced. In today's video, I'm gonna start going through the actual quantum randomizer construction that uh, Hayden and Preskill based their proposal on. This section of the paper will probably take several videos to get through as there's quite a lot of content and material that needs to be covered. So let's return now to the paper, section three, a quantum randomizer. And I will just continue as in the previous videos, reading through the paper, adding commentary and illustrations as, as we go along. Okay, section three, a quantum randomizer. Again, we imagine that Alice rec regrets recording some information and wants to destroy it. But this time, the information is not a bit string, rather it is quantum information stored in a k-qubit quantum memory. Now, whenever I see quantum memory, I have a picture in mind. Quantum memory is, for me, whether this is helpful or not, I don't know. But a quantum memory, for me, I always imagine some kind of physical system and the most convenient sort of mental picture that I, I carry around for quantum memory is a, is a system of two level, equivalent two level, two levels from an, some convenient atom. So somehow each qubit has either a zero or ground state and some excited state, we'll call it E here, but for later convenience, of course, we'll call the excited ground state one. These two states are somehow protected from decoherence from the environment and they're easy to manipulate. And I think of a quantum memory as just a collection of two level atoms of this kind. Uh, of course, in today's world, with the uh, prevalence of superconducting qubits, this is probably the wrong picture to keep in mind, but nonetheless, this is the one I have in mind. So we have k qubits, which you can variously think of as k superconducting qubits, if that's your thing you like, or as effective two-level atoms, or whatever, impurities, whatever architecture floats your boat. Um, so normally when we say that a quantum memory stores k qubits, we mean that the stored quantum state lives in a Hilbert space of dimension two to the k. Yeah, another comment is important here. Two level atoms, well atoms aren't two level systems. They are in fact infinite level systems. Just think of the hydrogen atom. Um, you, you, know, you have the, the Coulomb potential and you have an infinite sequence of bound states. And when we say two level atom, we're somehow picking out two protected uh, states in this infinite Hilbert space. So that's sort of worth bearing in mind that when you talk about a quantum memory, you know, there's all this baggage that comes along with a quantum memory. A quantum memory isn't just some pure two level system, just as a bit isn't really a pure two level system. A bit is a highly complex structure constructed from uh, a feedback device and logic gates and so on. Normally, when we say that a quantum memory stores k qubits, we mean that the stored quantum state lives in a Hilbert space of dimension two to the k, but we also mean something more, that the Hilbert space has a physically natural decomposition as a tensor product of k two level systems. Again, returning to the, the picture that I've drawn here, you, you know, this is the, my cartoon here of a, of a hydrogen atom. Here's the Hilbert space of the hydrogen atom. I mean, the Hilbert space of an hydrogen atom is extraordinarily complicated, right? You know, we have continua of states above the, the, the last bound state. Um, there's an infinite number of bound states and the Hilbert space of the system, I don't know, we'll call it H atom. Uh, you know, living inside this Hilbert space, we have somehow a, a quantum two level system, which is just two special states in there. But of course the Hilbert space is infinite dimensional and sort of, you know, there's an infinite discrete dimensional, a discrete infinite dimensional, uh, accountably infinite dimensional subspace of bound states and plus there's a continua of states above the, 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 uh, the bound states. And, you know, we have a qubit, which is the Hilbert space C to the two. 
that lives. We, we pulled out two states that we really like inside H atom. Uh, but you know, H atom also contains the bound states. Even for a hydrogen atom, or whatever, whatever, calcium, whatever atom floats your boat. Um, and it's worth pointing out that, that H bound is already infinite dimensional. Uh, I'll just put quote marks around this, L2N, just your favorite infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, we should distinguish, and what Hayden and Preskill are trying to do here is we're trying to distinguish between uh, natural structures in the orbit space. Now it's, it's straightforward and it's not really much different from a Cantor diagonal argument in set theory to say that L2N easily contains a tensor product of, of K qubits, right? That's such a Hilbert space is two to the K dimensional and a finite dimensional Hilbert space of dimension two to the K easily fits inside an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So when I write L2N, that's the Hilbert space spanned by, um, I'm gonna put scare quotes around, this is not strictly correct. Uh, well, okay, yeah. It, it's the Hilbert space spanned by the, an infinite set of basis states orthonormal basis states where these numbers n are in the natural numbers with the uh, zero attached. So L2n is just somehow a generic infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Of course, the high structure of the hydrogen atom is even indeed more complicated than that, but this is uh, a good enough cartoon for, for the point that I'm trying to make here. So the, the Hilbert space at your L2n corresponding to the bound states of just the hydrogen atom is infinite dimensional. There's a lot of them. And it contains every finite dimension of Hilbert space as a subspace. In particular, C2 to the K, which is naturally isomorphic to C2 tensored K times, that lives inside the bound states of a hydrogen atom. So why talk about K qubits? Why not just take a single hydrogen atom and then stick out K qubits in that space? Well, Hayden and Preskill uh, take care to, to address this point. So they say normally when we say that a, quantum memory stores k qubits, we mean that the stored quantum state lives in a Hilbert space of dimension two to the k, but we also mean something more, that the Hilbert space is a physically natural decomposition. I think this is really crucial uh, to, to, to emphasize this. Physically natural decomposition is a tensor product of k two level systems. For example, we might envisage the memory as a system of k spin one half particles. However, this tensor product decomposition will not be central to our discussion. So it will, for the most part, be adequate to regard Alice's message system M as a Hilbert space of dimension m equals two to the k without any special structure and where k need not be an integer. Um, k may, uh, that's a, a, a somewhat baffling um, comment there that k need not be an integer. Uh, what does this mean? Well, uh, it is possible to find natural Hilbert spaces whose growth with uh, the number of subsystems is non-integral. Um, this is the subject of anions um, and particles with exotic statistics. We'll leave that point here. This is not important for our discussion today. So we go ahead and talk about um, the way we're thinking about a quantum memory, namely the K spin one half particles or K qubits or K two level atoms. Then I point out that such a Hilbert space could live naturally in just the bound states of a single hydrogen atom. And then we say that uh, we don't really care today. Although, you know, in, it is important that we have a natural tensor product decomposition when talking about quantum memories, because this is this natural tensor product decomposition is what allows us to define an easy operation as something that acts on a single qubit and a hard operation as something that acts on many qubits. If you use a finite dimensional subspace of, of your favorite infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then uh, there's no distinguishing between local and global operations. This is a discussion that could take as many hours and uh, to go through uh, and is a little bit beside the point. So what we're meant to think of is that Alice's message system M Alice's message, message system M is really just some system with uh, 
Hilbert space described by c to power of 2 to the power of k, which is isomorphic to c2 tensed c2 k times. So, you know, indeed, apparently at this stage is actually okay if we think about the, this Ellis's message system as a subspace of the hydrogen node. Next, we need to reconsider some other features of the classical scenario. For example, what does it mean to say that Alice's quantum state can be recovered by Bob from the Hawking radiation? We don't necessarily mean that Bob can acquire a complete classical description of the state. That would be too much to ask. I mean, if you have a quantum state and you have to get a complete classical description of it, then you have to measure it an infinite number of times in order to extract out all the information required to specify the probability amplitude. So that's obviously too much to ask. Rather, we mean that Bob can do anything with a recovered state that he would have been able to do with the state of Ellis's memory if he had been able to access it in the first place before Ellis tried to destroy it. It is useful to imagine that a third party, Charlie, holds a reference system N with dimension N equals M that is maximally entangled with Ellis's memory. That is, the initial joint state of the memory and the reference system may be chosen to be the pure state here, this maximally entangled state. We say that N provides a purification of the state M. So let me now draw a little picture here. So somehow at, at the beginning of time, which we'll say is T equals minus infinity, there's three people involved in the story now. There's Alice, there's Bob, and there's Charlie, which we'll call A, B, and C. Alice has some state in her possession, some unknown quantum state to Bob. The state is unknown to Bob. Uh, how will they call the state later on? Let's have a look here. I'm just trying to find a notation that will be consistent with what they say later on, but actually it doesn't look like they give a name to Alice's state for a while yet, and I can't easily find it. So we'll just say that Alice has some, at the beginning of time, t equals minus infinity, Alice has some state that she wants to throw into the black hole and erase forever, hopefully. Bob has to have some state, he has some system in his possession. So Alice's system is M, Bob's system is N, and uh, Bob's system is initialized in some initial state. Now, it's very convenient to imagine that there's this third party, Charlie, who will uh, cooperate with Bob, and that Charlie is also in possession of a quantum system, and that Charlie's uh, quantum system uh, is also an n-dimensional system. Actually, I think, forget, forget what I said about Bob having an n, n, n system, Charlie's system is called n according to the paper. So it's very convenient to imagine that Charlie and Bob are have, have quantum systems and that, so coming back to the paper, it is useful to imagine that a third party, Charlie, holds a reference system N with dimension N equals M, so the same size as Alice's memory. That is the initial joint state of the memory in the reference system may be chosen to be this pure state here. So what's going on here is I've drawn the picture a little bit wrong, actually. Um, Charlie is meant to mimic all the potential messages that Alice could send. think later on, although maybe I'm, I'm now coming to doubt it, that uh, Charlie and Alice will, uh, Charlie and Bob will cooperate to try and um, get back Alice's message. Uh, I may be wrong about that. So we initially started off thinking that, that Alice had a message that she sends into the black hole. Here's the, the black hole here. The, the, Alice sends a message in to destroy it. But now what are we doing? We're introducing this other state, capital Phi, between Charlie and Alice. And capital Phi is this maximally entangled state here. maximally entangled state between Charlie and Alice. Although naturally they wrote it the other way around. Well, um, I'll try and keep the notation as consistent between the 
my pictures here and the uh, paper. However, it doesn't quite work with the way I've drawn Charlie and Alice here. So it's a convenient set to imagine that Charlie and Alice share this maximum entangled state here. So what's going on here? Well, we want to somehow deal with all possibilities at once. That's what we're trying to do here with this picture. We want to imagine we want to do our analysis in such a way that we can cover all possible states that Alice might want to throw away into the black hole. Now, by introducing a maximally entangled state here and doing our analysis for a maximally entangled state, it turns out we can mimic or simulate uh, Alice having thrown any particular state of in, uh, uh, into the black hole. How does that work? Well, uh, it's got to do with uh, what happens when you measure a maximally entangled state. So if we take here a maximally entangled state phi, the one above, and I'm gonna draw a little picture of this maximally entangled state. You know, at some point in the past, Charlie and Alice must have been together to share maximal entanglement. So sort of draw time going across in this picture here. Uh, here's Alice down the bottom, here's Charlie above, and they share this maximum entangled state. And what suppose we want to simulate Alice having prepared the state psi. Suppose that's our objective um, using this maximum entangled state that here. Well, we can do that by allowing Charlie to measure the maximum entangled state and post select on the measurement outcome. Because if you wanted to prepare, say, if you wanted, uh, if you wanted to consider the uh, scenario where Alice has prepared some state psi, then you can do that. You can actually mimic this uh, in the following way using a maximum entangled state between Alice and Charlie. So suppose here's, here's psi here, right? This, this is the state that we want to mimic or we want to consider. You know, Alice prepares this, this quantum state here and then sends it into the black hole. We can also equivalently, this is an effective equivalent description of preparing of Alice preparing the state. We could equivalently obtain psi uh, by instead considering the Alice Charlie maximally entangled state and Charlie doing some kind of special post selection, some measurement uh, and post selection uh, in order uh, that the posterior state that Alice is in possession of be exactly the state psi here. Now uh, it's a the general formula for what, what the measurement is that Charlie has to do in order to carry out that post selection uh, is not so complicated, I think. I think the measurement apparatus that, that Charlie has to apply in order to simulate the preparation of the state Psi in Alice's lab is this two outcome P over M here. So in order to simulate Alice preparing the state Psi, Charlie applies this following two outcome P over M here to his half of the maximally entangled state. So this will call outcome zero or click or no click and this will call outcome one or click. So at Charlie applies that to his half of the maximally entangled state this P of M and let's analyze what happens in the click event. So what happens if Charlie applies this two outcome P of M? Oops, I've done it the other way around above, so I'll do it this way down here. What happens if he applies this measurement outcome? We'll call this E1 and E0. So Charlie applies the measurement script curly M to the joint state and he obtains the outcome E1 or click event. Then what is the posterior state in Alice's lab? Let's find out. So we first uh, write out the maximum entangled state phi, then we apply uh, this P over M element to find out what is the posterior state of Alice's 
laboratory. So we've got the inner product between psi and A here. So the inner product between psi and A is the, the has a coefficient psi bar A, right, complex conjugate. And the state that's now in Charlie's laboratory is psi, right? Because we've we obtained the outcome psi. Uh, e1 click, which, and that projects Charlie's state into the, the state psi. And Alice has in her laboratory a slightly different state. Than the one intended, actually. What we get is the complex conjugate of the desired state. So this actually tell us the answer for how to create Charlie's measurement. So as to cr create the state psi in Alice's laboratory. So by doing this measurement and post selecting the outcome, Charlie can uh, have created effectively in Alice's laboratory or prepared Alice's uh, quantum system in the posterior state psi bar, the complex conjugate of psi. Okay, so how do we get the state psi into Alice's laboratory? Well, we just replace all the the states here with psi bars, and that will in fact get rid of the extra complex conjugate that we encountered when we uh, analyzed this experiment, and then everything will be fine. So this is the way that Charlie can uh, posterior, uh, after the fact, prepare any particular state in Alice's laboratory with some probability. I mean, notice that this thing here is subnormalized, right? Meaning that the, this outcome doesn't occur 100% of the time. That's why post selection is involved, involved in preparing the state in Alice's laboratory. So this whole idea of introducing a maximally entangled state with a reference party, Charlie, is a way of allowing us to delay the preparation uh, of Alice's input state until after we analyze the rest of the protocol. Now this is a, a very useful device that's often used in quantum machine theory and it's certainly one that we will use, exploit in this, this, this paper here to analyze uh, the, di the subsequent dynamics uh, of the protocol that Alice and Bob carry out. Now, uh, is it just to, at this point, just think of Charlie as a convenient reference point I think, I believe, as I said later on, Charlie will cooperate with Bob uh, in order to try and recover the state, but I may be wrong about that. So such a state is called a purification of the state that, um, that Alice holds. Uh, I should, of course, make a comment on the word purification. Uh, this is something that you can find in a typical quantum information textbook, but nonetheless, I should uh, comment on that here. What does this terminology mean? Purification, suppose Alice has some arbitrary mixed state rho A, uh, and if you write it in its eigenbasis, I've been using A's, such a arbitrary mixed state looks something like this, right? a mixture of pure states. Now a purification of a mixed arbitrary mixed state is a pure state of a joint system C A. So this is just of Alice's system here, A. Alice's system is called M actually. Uh, and a purification is a joint pure state such that when you trace out the reference system N, you get back the state that you started with. So here's And I'm actually going to write out a purification. Here is indeed a purification that does the job. So note that I've written out a new quantum state. I've called it rho a ket. Rho a ket is a pure state now, but of a joint system, a bigger system. And this state here has the very uh, remarkable property that if you take row A ket 
and then you trace out the reference system, you throw it away into the bin, then you'll get back exactly the state uh, row A. So that's what the terminology purification means. Purification means a pure state of a bigger joint system such that when you trace out the additional subsystem that you introduced, you get back the original mixed state that you started with. Okay. And indeed you can see that N provides a purification of the state of M because it's a pure, joint pure state. If Charlie holds N, but Alice retains M, then the density operator for N, as in the one that Bob, uh, Charlie holds, upon tracing out M is maximally mixed. Okay, you take a, a maximally entangled state, phi, if you trace out M, then you get the following maximally entangled state here. Okay, I gotta do this properly. So firstly, put the big trace over M outside, and then I gotta write out the maximum entangled state phi twice, right? We gotta write the form the density operator before we take a partial trace. So the density operator for the maximally entangled pure state phi looks like this, Alice, Charlie, Alice, Charlie, or of course we've been calling this system M and N. Now we do the partial trace over the M subsystem. We get a delta function. Oops, this has got to be A primes here. We get a delta function and we're left with a single sum like so. It's another little exercise you should do just to remind yourself of these things if you've forgotten them or if you're encountering this for the first time. So upon tracing out the density operator for M, we encounter the density operator for Charlie's reference system and it's maximally mixed. Right? Right? This is this state here that Charlie has after throwing Alice's system in the bin is the identity divided by M, the dimension of M, which is maximally what we call maximally mixed. If sometime later Bob is able to extract from the Hawking radiation a subsystem of dimension M that is maximally entangled with N, then we may say that Bob has recovered the quantum information that had been stored in Alice's quantum memory. This would imply in particular that if the initial state of M had been a pure state, not entangled with the reference system, then Bob would be able to recover psi in his chosen subsystem. Okay, this is a crucial sentence. Okay, let's draw the picture here. So we have Charlie, Alice, Bob. I'll draw Charlie, Alice, and Bob a bit lower. Charlie and Alice share this maximally entangled state, phi. Alice throws it into the black hole. The black hole radiates. Bob collects the radiation using some amazing Dyson sphere type thing and then does some processing of this radiation. And if he is able to recover a subsystem maximally mixed, is that the wording? A uh, maximally, um, If Bob recovers from this information, everything about Alice's uh, qubits that were thrown into the black hole and he recovers a, a, a subsystem, I guess we'll call it M prime. Right? These are Alice's qubits that she threw into the black hole. Imagine he's able to completely recover the qubits that Alice threw into the black hole. Well then those qubits will be uh, those qubits worth of information will be stored presumably in a different register, that's why I'm calling them prime, and uh, such that this subsystem has the same dimension as Alice's qubits. Suppose that full recovery was made, right? This is the, the key point here. So Bob manages to fully recover the information that Alice throws into the black hole, then what he'll have in his possession is a maximally mixed state from his, the the perspective of his laboratory, he can't measure joint measurements between Charlie and, and, uh, and Alice, 
But what he'll have done is he'll have recovered all the entanglement that Charlie initially shared with Alice. So after this protocol, what the picture will look something like this. We'll have that Alice and Bob, sorry, that, that Charlie and Bob are now maximally entangled. All right, so the, the initial state shared by Alice and Charlie was this maximally entangled state phi. Phi goes through into the black hole, comes back out, and then ends up in Bob's possession. So the end result is that Charlie and Bob now share a maximally entangled pure state or relative to their local laboratories, a maximally mixed state. So that's what full recovery would look like uh, in this scenario here where Alice and Charlie initially share this maximally entangled state phi. And I think this is a good moment to uh, finish for today's video. We've managed to analyze the setup that Hayden and Preskill propose. I've illustrated the uh, terminology with some examples here. I've also explained some of the basic quantum information protocols that are required to uh, understand the subsequent analysis that Hayden and Preskill make in their paper. In particular, talking about this sort of principle of delayed measurement to be able to consider all possible input states of Alice, of Alice at the same time. And also the notion of purification uh, also will be a crucial concept in the subsequent analysis. And finally, we came to the notion of what a full recovery would look like with respect to this entangled initial state scenario. So that's it for today. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video when we will continue the analysis of the uh, quantum example. But for, that, uh, for now, that's it. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye.